I graduated from Principia with a de degree in as a Bachelor of Science in Physics. Now I had taken art too uh, because physics and art combined really constitute industrial design. I learned that uh, at USC the architecture department had a good course in industrial design and I enrolled there and really had a great time they had a wonderful color workshop. Uh, they had a good rendering course. And uh, I had a teacher who was most dedicated to us, teaching us how to render uh, in a manner that uh, was very photographic. Cranbrook was a wonderful place to go to school. It was a most, one of the most beautiful environments that were man-made in the whole United States. It had a, a uh, the architect of it was Aliel Saarinen, who was a Finn, and he worked for 25 years doing buildings there, so they all had a nice relationship to each other at that time. And uh, the, the, uh, the landscape architect, incidentally, was the same uh, architect, Butler Sturdivant, who had done the campus at Principia a world-famous man, too. <clears throat> in Cranbrook, there was a different structure. Uh, you were not given grades. Uh, you were to choose your assignments. Choose them, whatever you wanted to do. But you had to do them and go through with them and finish them. And your professor would look at them. And uh, halfway through the course, he would tell you whether you were going to pass or not. So you really worked very hard to be sure by the time you got that halfway through that he was well enough impressed to, uh, to uh, put you through the whole thing. Uh, the curriculum at C Cranbrook, which was an art academy, uh, was, included architecture, weaving, uh, pottery, uh, industrial design, woodworking, sculpture, uh, the whole thing. And uh, you were privileged, any student was privileged to go and have visits with any professor in any other field of endeavor beyond his own professors. And I did that. And for example, I went to have a visit with Carl Millis, uh, the Swedish sculptor, who was at that time considered to be the greatest living sculptor. The educational philosophy of Cranbrook uh, was uh, pretty much uh, devil may care. You were to find your own way. One of the projects uh, that I undertook was to do a resilient chair. Uh, this uh, was something that I had a visualization of and I shared it with Sven Steen, who was the cabinet making professor in the school. Sven used to come into my uh, studio and sit and talk, uh, smoking his pipe and theorizing. Uh, and uh, uh, I told him what I was intending to do here. And he said, well, David, uh, I, think, uh, I think that uh, you uh, will uh, do the best thing since Eames of us here. And so, uh, well, I took great encouragement by that. I appreciated his his, his comments, uh, and so I went on and completed it, and I uh, engaged uh, Jack Lenore Larson, the great weaver, to uh, weave this for me. And uh, then I had to, uh, f I finished it all, and I called uh, Mr. Steen into my studio. He sat on it, bounced around, and said, this is not uh, the best thing since Eames was here. This is better than Eames. And, and so uh, this also was uh, uh, designed to be bulletproof because in 1950 we were involved in the Korean War and uh, I wanted to have something that could protect our pilots from enemy fire. And so I took a, a sample of this uh, out to a uh, dirt bank and I borrowed a uh, re 45 revolver and uh, fired away at it, and it uh, splatted the bullets out on the surface of it. 
in the summer of 1951, I stayed on at Cranbrook, spent the whole summer using the tools and building my first commission, which was a sample chair for the No Sag Spring Company. And uh, that chair was a precursor of this chair, which ultimately got into production in the 70s. Uh, in about 1960, I decided that I should call on Florence Knoll of Knoll Associates, later Knoll International, and uh, see if uh, I could uh, uh, do a chair for them. And uh, I, it took me several months to do a scale model, one quarter scale, of a chair that I thought would be ideal for them and they would surely grab and pay me royalties for. I went back to my room and uh, sat down and thought, what can I do that will really impress her and give her a product that is really needed in this world? And the thought came to me after much prayer, why don't you see how many chairs you can get into a certain space? And I laid it out on my drawing board and figured it all out. and. Uh, by golly, I came to the conclusion I could get 40 chairs in a height of four feet stacked. So I realized that this time I couldn't just give her a quarter scale model. I had to give her a full size chair. Not only one full size chair, but two, because I needed to show her how they stacked. After many months, I had two full-size chairs to show. And so I gave Florence Knoll a call, and yes, she would see me again. She was a very patient lady. I took two chairs into the showroom. She came around the wall, looked at it, and I said, this is my new chair. Will you please sit on it? She sat on it, got up, and I pulled them apart and I said, actually, it's two chairs. In 15 seconds, she said, we'll take it. This was a very exuberant time for me. Finally, I'd, I had made a deal with Noel, and uh, uh, that went on for about six months. And uh, peculiarly, I received a letter saying that they decided not to go ahead with it. That was a very disappointing thing. I was down in the dumps again. There was an annual show in New York of office furniture held in the Coliseum, and I went to it, and as I w was walking down a hallway, I looked down an aisle, and there was the Noel vice president with whom I had negotiated the contract. And I thought, oh, I must walk past this aisle. I don't want to see him anymore. I mean, his company has offended me. But a little voice said, no, you have every right to go down this aisle, extend your hand, and say hi, Chuck, which I did. And he said, well, I'm just out of a job. Apparently, they had let him go. He was their national sales manager. But in the ensuing 10 or 15 minutes, he told me how he would undertake to sell my design. He advised me, and his advice included going to Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, a great international architectural firm. I went there. They accepted the design with open arms, and they were going to put it in a university of Illinois, Chicago campus, for which they needed 17,000 chairs. This was my big opportunity. They referred me then to GF Office Furniture Limited, <clears throat> which did take a, who did take a license. In February 1964, there was a national sales meeting, and uh, a salesman from across the country and Canada came to see the product for the very first time. Uh, there was a model in the back of the hall 
who push a whole stack of 40 chairs forward. And when those salesmen saw that product, they really got excited. They jumped to their feet. They hooped and hollered and screamed and whistled. Uh, they were really sold on that product. <clears throat> there is uh, every three years the Triennale di Milano, which is held in Milan, Italy, and that is where a designed work from around the world uh, is taken and shown, and uh, many prizes are given. Our 144 chair was sent to that, having been selected by the American Committee, and uh, after the International Committee met, they gave it the top award in the whole world the Triennale di Milano Grand Premio. At this point, having received the great award, the Triennale Award, uh, I was deluged with letters, and GF was also, by European firms that wanted to take a license. This alerted GF to the potential of being involved in Europe, and I think it was a historical thing that American chairs should be shipped to Europe. The Danes had shipped a lot of European furniture to, Euro to the U.S., but not the other way around. About this time, the Sydney Opera House was being built, and the world-famous architect, Jorn Utzon, specified our chairs for it, and that was a big thrill. In 68, we had our first iteration uh, which was in molded veneer. And uh, subsequently, uh, the staff and I are working on rattan model and uh, this uh, translucent model. For many thousands of years, architects have been involved with the use of modules. For example, the pyramids. Those great, huge stone blocks were modular units. Simply the same size, all of them the same size, simply stacked up and to make a pyramid. Uh, modules are very close to uh, the hearts of architects and have always been. Now in, uh, in Europe, uh, in England, uh, the basic module was the foot. Uh, it was the length of a king's foot. Uh, ultimately, in the 1700s, uh, it was decided to commonize all of the dimensioning of the continent by coming up with the metric system. Uh, since about 1951, I have been interested in uh, my own modular system, and the purpose of it uh, was to relate uh, products much more closely to the size of people. Uh, I have what I call the mod. Now this is a cubic expression of it. Uh, an edge is five and five-eighths inches. Now what is five and five-eighths inches? What does it mean in its relationship to the human being? Uh, sometime in the 40s or 50s, uh, Haywood Wakefield Company, which was a furniture manufacturer, and Harvard University got together and they measured the length of the lower leg of thousands of train riders, including the heels, because train riders don't ride without shoes on. And they came up with the average height, male, female, height there as being 16 and 9 tenths inches. Well, if I take my mod and I multiply it by 3, I get 16.875, almost right on the 16 and 9 tenths inches of Haywood Wakefield. Uh, these uh, chairs, the 14 4 chair, was designed according to mods. Uh, the seat height and the seat width are 16 and 9 tenths inches, 16.875 uh, inches. There have been surveys uh, where the oxygen consumption of people, people climbing stairs uh, have been done, and they found that an ideal height for a stair, a step, is one mod. 
one of the phenomenal things about the 40 and 4 is that it's been in continuous, unbroken production in the United States for 41 years. As a matter of fact, no strike has stopped its production. And of course, it's being manufactured continuously in Europe, in Indonesia, and in Brazil. So for over 50 years, I've worked with this product. And I've gone through absolute hell. I've been optimistic and then pessimistic. Uh, I've been uh, accepted and I've been totally turned down. And finally, uh, I was accepted by GF. Those executives had great foresight and I owe them a great debt of gratitude for having seen a product that was going to be a huge success.